This practical technique video is going to look at the details of preparing an organic liquid. So where do we use this technique? Organic liquids are often immiscible with water. This means that they're not water soluble, so they don't mix. And this is usually because they are relatively non-polar or they don't contain enough hydrogen bonding to mix with water. So that means that we can use this technique in more than one place. We might use it, for example, in the preparation of a haloalkane. And we would do that by using nucleophilic substitution with an alcohol. Or we could do it in the preparation of an alkene, for example, using an elimination reaction from a haloalkane. Or we could use it in the preparation of esters. So esters, although they are polar because they've got that CO bonds, they don't have hydrogen bonding and they're typically therefore quite large molecules that don't mix with water that well. There are other things that you might think that would mix with water. So, for example, alcohols or carboxylic acids. But if they have a very large nonpolar group, like a benzene ring, then it means that they're unlikely to be miscible with water. So we can use that technique there as well. For example, benzoic acid. We don't use this technique with solid organic compounds. So when it gets particularly large, it's more likely to be a solid than a liquid. So aspirin is a good example of that. Solid compounds, we use a technique called recrystallization to purify the product. Obviously, there are loads of different reaction conditions. This video is not about how you make a haloalkane or how you make an alkene or how you make an ester, because they will all be different uh, reaction conditions and they can vary with examples. What we're looking at here in the practical side is how we separate that liquid and purify it. So we have to get the organic liquid away from all the other substances that might be in the reaction mixture when the reaction's finished. And one of the most common things is that we're going to have aqueous substances. So we're going to have organic liquid that does not mix with the other things that are left over and our leftover reagents are probably going to be aqueous. So we use something called a separating funnel. It's used to separate any immiscible liquids. They could be cylindrical in shape, so the same width all the way down, uh, but they're quite commonly shaped like the one shown here, which is larger at the top. So it does look more like the shape of a funnel. And it's got an area where we can put a, a stopper in the top, which means that we can shake it up. And then when we let these uh, liquids settle, they will form two layers because they're immiscible and they separate according to density. So the less dense liquid will be at the top and the most dense liquid will be at the bottom. Now, it's very, very common that the organic layer, the liquid that you actually want to keep, is less dense than water. So quite often the organic layer is at the top, but you mustn't always assume this. So sometimes you'll be given the density of the liquid in the question and you have to determine whether that liquid will be at the top or at the bottom. So water, we should know, has a density of one gram per centimeter cubed. So if the organic liquid is more dense than one gram per centimeter cubed, it will go to the bottom. And this could be true for haloalkanes that contain something quite heavy like bromoalkanes or iodoalkanes. And then at the bottom of the separating funnel is a tap, which is just like the tap at the bottom of a burette. You can use it to let out one of the liquid layers. So the first thing we can do with the separating funnel, we can actually just tip our whole reaction mixture in there. And if our aqueous layer is at the bottom, so the, the stuff that contains all the aqueous dissolved stuff, we can simply drain off the aqueous part and keep that organic liquid at the top of the funnel. But that's not enough. You can't just drain off the aqueous layer and hope there are no other contaminating substances. There's a lot more steps to this process. A very common step is to neutralize excess acid. So this could be because you used acid as a reagent. Uh, for example, you might use hydrochloric acid to make a chloroalkane. But often we also use acids as catalysts 
in, uh, organic reactions such as making esters, oxidation reactions, all sorts of things. And we're going to neutralize the acid by adding a base. And the base that we use is sodium carbonate or sodium hydrogen carbonate solution. These are weak bases and they dissolve very well in water. We're never going to use sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is a strong base, but it's also a nucleophile. So if we had a halo alkane in there and we added sodium hydroxide, it will react with it to form an alcohol. Or if we had an ester in there and we added sodium hydroxide, then it could start hydrolyzing my ester back into the carboxylic acid and the alcohol. So we don't use that. We use our sodium hydrogen carbonate or sodium carbonate. And because we're using a carbonate, we're going to get carbon dioxide gas produced. So you're going to see fizzing. You don't just pour it in the funnel and leave it. Every time you add something to a separating funnel, you need to invert the funnel to mix the layers. So you would put a stopper on the top, tip it upside down. You have to then take the stopper out immediately to release the gas, otherwise pressure will build up. And then you just let your layers separate, drain off the aqueous layer as before. And you might need to do this a few times and you know when you've neutralized the acid because there's no more carbon dioxide being produced so you don't see fizzing anymore. So you've now neutralized the acid but your liquid is still going to be contaminated. There's going to be excess base and there's also going to be salt from the neutralization reaction. So you now wash your organic liquid. You add distilled water. You're still going to invert the flask to mix the liquids together and then you're going to allow the layers to reform again. So any inorganic substances such as excess sodium carbonate or the salt that you made from neutralization of the acid, they will be extremely soluble in water and much more soluble than they are in the organic liquid. So they will move into the aqueous layer and as before, you're then going to open the tap and remove the aqueous layer. And again, just like the acid washing, you might have to do this a couple of times. So we've now got a layer of organic liquid and it doesn't contain any acid or inorganic salts, but it still contains water. So you can't remove all of the water just with a separating funnel. There's still going to be molecules of water that are mixed in with the organic liquid and it doesn't really matter how long you leave those layers to separate. They'll still be there. So to remove that, we use a drying agent which is actually just an anhydrous solid salt such as sodium chloride or magnesium sulfate. So these solids are very, very good at absorbing water. You add the solid to your organic liquid and you can see the solid getting wet. So you know what like a wet powder looks like. It will start to clump together and it will be absorbing the water and all the moisture out of the organic liquid. You know when you've added enough because the extra solid that you add doesn't kind of clump together and look wet anymore. It stays looking dry and fine and powdery. So when you got to that stage, you can just remove the solid drying agent by filtration because obviously it's not soluble in the organic liquid. Final stages. We've separated our organic liquid. We've neutralized the acid. We've washed it with distilled water and then we've dried it using a solid drying agent. Final stage to obtain an extra pure product, we would probably use distillation because we're trying to get a liquid. Because we're distilling an organic liquid, it's much safer to use an electric heating mantle rather than a flame to heat the flask. And if the liquid is particularly volatile, we might also put ice around the collection vessel at the end of the condenser uh, just to prevent any extra loss of our product through evaporation. 